this evening to the, um, how, the panel on how to get published, particularly in the study of religion, at the European Association for the Study of Religions in Tartu, Estonia. And we have here um, people that represent different uh, areas of publication and careers. So on my furthest is Michael Stausberg, and uh, he is editing um, a journal, and he will talk about that in a minute. And also gr we have James White, who is um, uh, at the u university here, so a local, and Greg Alles, who is also an editor. Uh, of a series and journal, and we have Jenny Butler, uh, c considered early career, but already done so much, and uh, and Val, uh, Valerie Hall from Equinox Publishers, and uh, Joshua Wells from the um, Routledge Publishers. I want to have each of them introduce themselves in turn and what they work on, and then we can start a discussion. So, start with you, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, what we work on, what do you mean? Yeah, what you edit in your oh, experience, right, right, right. yes. Okay, yes. Uh, well, thanks for showing up. It's a bit weird to <laughs> look, to sit down here and to kind of, well, at your service. Um, and uh, I, I have been uh, one of the two editors of a journal called Religion uh, since 2008. Uh, my co-editor is a Canadian, Stephen Engler, uh, and uh, religion has started in, uh, since around uh, 50 years back, 49, basically. Greg was on the editorial board for decades, I suppose. Yeah, uh, and, until you kicked me off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the journal is published with uh, Routledge, and um, <clears throat> since 2000. 12, I believe it had a series of, publish of, of publishers uh, in between, and uh, uh, I uh, also co-edit two book series, uh, one uh, called Religion and Reason for De, De Greuter, and one called Critical Studies in Religion slash Religionswissenschaft, which is a bilingual series published by Vandenhoek and de Ruprecht. I think that should suffice for the moment. Thank you. Mm. Uh, hello, so I'm James Whites. Um, as our chair introduced me, I do work here at the uh, University of Tartu as a research fellow. Um, but actually, most of my career, um, the last three, four years, has been spent at the Ural Federal University in Yekaterinburg, Russia. Um, I'm, a young I'm a young scholar at the beginning of my career, as that story would suggest. I've probably published in the last four or five years about, uh, I think, 10 articles in both English language journals and Russian language journals. I do have some experience on the other side of the coin because I am actually the English language editor of Questa Rosica, which is the uh, journal of Russian studies for Euro Federal University. Um, currently on both Scopus and Web of Science. So I do have both the experience of uh, a young, a junior academic publishing, but also being on the editorial side of things. So thank you very much. Right. Hi, I'm Greg Ellis. I wish I could say I were at the beginning of my career. Uh, it'd be nice to be a young scholar again, uh, but of course I'm not. Uh, I've been co-editing Newman almost as long as Mikhail has been co-editing religion. Started that in 2010, first with Olaf Hammer and now with Lara Feld. Um, I was also, as Mikhail mentioned, on the editorial board of uh, religion for a long time. I think I started that in 94. And uh, MTSR, Method and Theory in the Study of Religion, I think in 96, eventually they get tired of you being on the editorial board and rotate you off, right? Uh, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and um, so maybe that's enough to say. Jenny. Um, I'm Jenny Butler, and I'm based in the Department of Study of Religions at University College Cork. I'm the secretary of the Irish Society for the Academic Study of Religions. Um, I've also been on a number of editorial boards, and I've guest edited uh, some peer-reviewed journal volumes, um, and I published early on uh, as a PhD student, um, so I think that's why, that's what I'm here to speak about. Um, so. 
Hi, I'm Valerie Hall. I work for Equinox Publishing. Um, I've worked there since 2004, which was the beginning of the company, and previously worked at Continuum. And I do the marketing for the books and journals, but I also do some editorial work on the book side. Uh, good evening, my name is Josh Wells. I work for Routledge. Um, I'm one of two religion editors at Routledge. So my colleague, uh, Rebecca Schillebeer, does uh, books sort of for undergrads, so pedagogical stuff, uh, textbooks. And my uh, focus is on research level books in religious studies, uh, so monographs and edited collections. Yes, and I should introduce myself as chair of this panel. I am Suzanne Owen, uh, based at Leeds Trinity University in the UK. I am also edit the journal for the British Association for the Study of Religions and on editorial boards as well. So next, yeah, so next actually, I would, um, we, we will open up to discussion very soon, but I thought maybe to start with, how did you first get something published? And just say, and for the editors of the publishers, what was your first uh, going out to find something to publish, or how did that work? How did you go about that? So, so Mikhail, sorry, I mispronounced your name earlier. So Mikhail Stausberg. So, how did you first get published, and in what? Uh, good question. Uh, I think I started with book reviews, um, and. Uh, Right, and uh, I think my first proper article was published in a Scandinavian journal called Chaos, uh, and that is, uh, at that time, was a Danish-Norwegian co-production, uh, and that was based on a conference uh, paper I gave. Is, th is that sufficient? Mm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my first publications, well, I have to echo the comments of Mikhail, um, that my first series of publications were book reviews. Um, I think good training for later. Um, but my first serious couple of publications, the first one I did was um, an article which was translated into Russian for the journal which, uh, for which I now work. Um, I didn't work for it when, I, when it was published, um, which was asked by a colleague of mine who is one of the only other people who specializes in the same subjects which I specialize in because I chose an entirely irrelevant subject for my PhD thesis. Um, but my first, I think I would say, if you want to describe it in this way, major peer-reviewed English publication was for the uh, Canadian Journal of Russian History. Um, and of course, it was an entirely sort of different process with full sort of peer review, sort of um, entirely different checks and balances one had to tick off than publishing in the Russian journal, which was much more informal, where the peer review team was internal and tended to be far less exacting. So that was my sort of uh, dual experience, if you like, uh, of publishing. I don't really recall, to be honest with you. Um, I don't remember what the first publication was. I'd have to look at the CV and find out which came out first. No, I don't have it. No, no, no. Uh, it's not there. Um, I worked as an editorial assistant for History of Religions Journal uh, when I was a graduate student. So I kind of knew the process. I knew what to do, right? I don't know that my first article came out in HR, but um, as a grad student, I also co-wrote several things with Joseph Kitagawa. Uh, and did some work with uh, Kurt Rudolph, who's a Gnosis specialist. And so I sort of got into the, got into the business that way, right? Um, so that's another way that you can do that, is to co-write with um, um, your senior supervisors and so on. As far as I recall, um, the first publication was uh, in a peer-reviewed journal called uh, Cosmos, produced by the Traditional Cosmology Society. Um, and that was on the neo-pagan ritual year and gender. And it was a special issue of the journal uh, that came out in 2002, but it was actually, well, it was dated 2002, but I think it had actually been backdated. So my first publication would have been, um, I think the first one was a, a book chapter in a book called um, Communicating Cultures that was edited by Ulrich Kockel and Mairead Nekra and it was published by Lit for Lag. You'll have to excuse me because I have a cold, so I'm trying not to cough. 
Thanks. Um, I can't remember exactly the first one, um, but because I go to a lot of conferences, because I do the marketing um, at the academic conferences, my involvement with commissioning tends to be in talking to people at the conferences um, where they can see the kind of books that we publish and approach us with proposals. Um, so that's kind of one of the main reasons why I go to conferences like this, and, and that is how I'm involved in commissioning. Already got one. Uh, so uh, it's also a while since I commissioned my first book. Um, so I actually commissioned my first book as an editorial assistant. Uh, so before I was an editor, so uh, one thing I neglected to mention in my uh, introduction is that I've been working at Rutledge now for nearly 10 years, but I've only been on the religion list for three and a half years. And um, that's maybe something to bear in mind when you're preparing your proposal that not every um, commissioning editor actually has their academic background in the subject that they're commissioning in. So my academic background is in literature and I commissioned my first book in, in uh, sports science. So it was the uh, absolutely vital tome, uh, The Science of Equestrian Sports was my first ever book. And uh, similarly, I happened to be attending a conference and I met an academic there, wanted to publish, and the editor that was looking after me uh, said, well, as you've made the contact um, as a development opportunity, you can uh, see the book through the process. So I was supervised in doing that. I'm Jason Von Bohm, a PhD student at the University of Tartu. My question is, what is the usual, is there a usual amount of time between a submission of an article and the decision on whether to publish it and then the actual publication. Because I heard that one, a couple of journals, it takes them one to two years. So I'm just wondering what kind of range there is. Yeah, we can start with the two at the end, two, uh, two well, journal. I mean, I'm, I can, uh, I can Greg? Two. I can oh. give mine. Yeah, okay. Um, Jay. Uh, uh, yes, um, my experience, I mean, I'm assuming we're talking about English language journals here. My experience has been Yes, one and a half to two years uh, process. Um, it can depend, as far as I've seen, basically on where you submit the article in terms of its content and the match between the content and the journal. So for instance, I submitted a Russian history article to a general European history journal not very long ago. It took them a very long time to find peer reviewers simply because they did not have them in their lists, in their contact lists, uh, specialists on Russian history. So it was, um, for what I regard as being a, a rather um, second rank publication, took a extremely long time. Um, but generally, yes, one and a half to two years has been my experience. There are a lot of practical problems involved, a lot of practical issues. On the one side, it's uh, a matter of getting something reviewed. And that's often, oh, I don't know what your experience is like, Mikhail, or yours is like, James, but that's often outside of our control. I've got, you know, sometimes you get a peer review in within a week, and it's very positive, and then you're waiting months and months, somebody's agreed to review it, they don't respond, they don't respond, they don't respond, you nag, you nag, you nag, right? Uh, and, and that's a frustrating experience, that's on one end. The other end is in terms of how much copy you have in the pipeline. Um, for a while, when Olaf and I were editing uh, Newman, um, Olaf, we were both saying, look, you're a, a, a junior, you're a, a, a young career, or, or a new career scholar, you're, you're a junior scholar. Uh, we've got a backlog. Uh, we can't publish anything that you give us until 2019. Uh, so I've, I, I recommended to several people to go other places because they needed to get published more, more quickly, right? That strategy also backfires because uh, the word gets out, oh, you've got a backlog, it's going to take a while, and then people stop sending you stuff, right? So you've got to be careful about that. But, you know, you've got those two factors that you think, and you, you want to be fair. I mean, if somebody's turned, you got an article accepted, they're in line first, right? So you have to sort of do that. So it's hard to say exactly, it's hard to predict exactly how long it's going to take, right? Um, and, uh, I mean, you can always ask the, you can always ask the editor. Um, if I think, you know, you need a publication out sooner than I can get it out, I'll tell you, this looks good, but go someplace else, because you need to have that out. Right, now I can only speak uh, for religion, and we do publish these figures, 
uh, roughly every other year in editorials where we list the referees, where we give the statistics about the, uh, the time, usually with religion. And of course, we are subject to the same factors as mentioned by Greg. Uh, it takes a three month per decision step. Uh, so that means that uh, you, usually we are able to provide a first decision after three months. But a first decision is very rarely to accept as is. Right. Uh, that almost never happens. So then comes a second and uh, then you are again in this three month loop, right? Uh, so uh, I think where much time is actually being lost, if you might say it like this, uh, in this process where it adds up to these horrendously sounding figures like a year or two is actually that when the authors get their uh, review back, they have other things to do. So they do not right away sit down and revise and rewrite their articles, but then they get to it a couple of months later and then they take their time so sometimes we do not get a second version back until after a year. Uh, so that means when you then again go through the three month and then you maybe you have another round and again you get it back after six months or so, then you end up with two years. But it has been with the journal only for twice three months. So uh, it, it's also to at this the author's speed to, to revise. And then you see different attitudes. Uh, some authors try to uh, cut it short uh, by saying, well, I mean, by just doing superficial revisions, uh, kind of doing some sort of lip service to what is required, while others basically rewrite their papers. And then that, of course, takes much more time, but might be a more a uh, rewarding exercise uh, because then, of course, if you do just superficial revisions, chances are high that uh, you get it back again, uh, that referees aren't, aren't happy yet. So then, of course, you can complain that it takes so much time, but it, it's also the authors who are involved here as, as the crucial factor. And uh, now I agree that uh, uh, not all referees uh, read the articles in the most sympathetic ways. Uh, uh, but this is also their job, uh, as it were. And uh, um, the point is that uh, as authors, we, I mean, we are not just editors, we are also authors, so we, we are kind of also subject to the same process. So we, we find ourselves misunderstood, right? Why does the referee don't get it? Right? What, what I'm trying to say. Uh, now, um, you might say as a conspiracy theorist that, I mean, they don't want me published and uh, or they are stupid and they are malevolent or what do I know? But the point is often really what, we, what, what, what seems very clear to us when we write isn't very clear to others who read. Um, so so, um, uh, so we, we then really have to take that to heart. I mean, uh, these people did a job, they did read the thing, and then as authors we should also uh, actually, uh, it's our, also our, it's the, the referee's duty to give us a favorable reading, but it's also our duty to give the referee's report a favorable reading. Uh, and, and that means that one really takes that serious. I, I disagree just a little bit. Yeah. I don't think it's the referee's duty to give you a favorable reading. But a fair I, reading. A fair reading, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. A fair reading and an honest reading. Yeah. Uh, and I think the worst thing you can do as an author is not take a referee's report seriously. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Take it seriously and revise. Probably the, the thing you don't want is a quick decision. If I give you a decision in two weeks, three weeks. It's not good. Right. <laughs> it probably means that I decided within 24 hours that this was not really something that we wanted, but I didn't want you to feel too badly. So I'm going to hold on to it for two or three weeks and then give you a, a, a statement saying, no, this is not for us, right? And maybe give you some indications. So right. uh, the, the, the process is there to ensure that your work is the best work possible for the sake of the journal mm -hmm. and for your sake as well. So participate yeah. in the process and take it seriously. I would like to add, I guess, um, to, would you say generally that to expect some revision? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and in my experience too, I think you expect some revision. We can move on to another question here. Um. Excuse me, may I just add one more comment? Uh, uh, please don't resend an unrevised article to a different journal. Uh, we see this happening all the time, that kind of journals that have been rejected here and there ex appear exactly in the same form on other editors' desk, yeah. desks, and uh, uh, you, uh, this isn't really a good way to make use of the resources that go into the peer review process on, on the one hand. On the other hand, be aware that our field is, I mean, it's, it's a collection of niches Right, uh, they're, they're, the, the pool of editors is, of, of, sorry, of, of potential referees is fairly restricted. So chances are very high that you run into the same referees everywhere. Yes. Um, yes. And, uh, and we are getting if these we messages. Or, or, we are getting these messages all the time, right. Greg, don't we? That uh, you know, I have seen this paper before right. Uh, right. For, a, for, for a different journal. And then, if you as, if you as an editor w with a good conscience could say, you know, you might have read it, but it's now a very different paper. Uh, then, then it might work, but it rarely is. Yeah, right. My name is Anja Bogacnik. I'm from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. Um, and my question is mostly uh, directed towards the monograph side of publishing. Um, so very briefly, uh, is it better to approach a series editor or the editor for the topic of religion in general? If there's a particular series uh, at a publishing house that fits what the monograph would be about, which way would be better to go? Thank you. Um, so uh, the answer to that predictably is that you can sort of do both <laughs> and um, which would I recommend? Uh, probably if you already have had some contact with the series editors, if maybe you at least kind of know each other by name or have been at the same conference, um, what, it might be quite useful to approach them in the first place because probably they'll be able to give you a bit of advice on how to put the proposal together in a way that's going to uh, appeal to an editor like me. Um, However, having said that, um, most editors like me uh, are generally pretty friendly and looking for ideas. And so actually, if you approached us with an idea, um, we would you know, give you guidelines and say, you know, this is how to submit a proposal. These are the sort of things we're looking for. Um, maybe the only sort of advantage of coming to an editor first is that obviously if you go to a series editor, you might be limiting yourself to that series. And it might be actually that the editor sort of says, well, Actually, I think there might be another series that it fits in a little bit better. So obviously, we've got um, a slightly wider view of our publishing output. Uh, and so, uh, you know, rather than have to sort of have a slightly awkward situation where you've got to extricate yourself <laughs> from a series, uh, you know, you might want to um, approach an editor first. So I, I think if you're very clear on who your proposal is for, and it's definitely going to fit in that series, and you've got a bit of perhaps, you know, a professional relationship with the series editors, I think it's absolutely not inappropriate at all to approach them. Uh, but uh, you would, you know, it would be absolutely fine to approach the the sort of the publishing editor as well uh, because we'll we'll have a conversation anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, whether it comes in via them or comes in via me, um, we'll always share that proposal and discuss it first. So mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Michael Salzberg would like to answer this too. Yeah, right. As a series editor, of course, uh, of course, I would like to uh, I would like you to contact me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because I mean, usually uh, as series editors, you have a clear understanding of what kind of things you want to have in your series. Uh, and uh, the publishers might not always kind of uh, have the same clarity uh, in visions for series. Um, and even as a series editor, of course, you might say, you know, maybe you want to talk to this series. Uh, so, I mean, we, we do, do not just say usually, well, we, we don't fit, but we might, we might also say, um, suggest other or, or alternative uh, series. And, and please bear in mind that the national uh, publication landscapes are very different. Uh, so when you work with the British, 
uh, press, uh, they usually operate very different from a German press, for example, or an Italian one. Uh, so there are very big national differences also in terms of how to proceed with proposals or, for example, British presses are kind of, or, or Anglo presses are more averse to publishing PhD theses as they are. Whereas this is quite normal in Germany, for example, where they would require only minor revisions uh, and not a complete rewrite of your work. So uh, be aware that the, the, uh, the publishing uh, requirements and strategies and procedures and timelines, etc., are very different according to which country you go to. And previously, that was kind of... Uh, uh, not really for you to worry, because if you wanted to publish in English, you had to go to, a, to an Anglo publisher anyway. But now, since uh, also German or Italian publishers or French ones even uh, publish in English, you as an author also have much more choice actually to, um, to, to kind of draw benefits from this relatively inhomogeneous uh, publishing landscape. Yeah. I would actually like to take um, that kind of question to Jenny and James about how did the, uh, propo your experience of proposing for uh, book length projects? Um, I think I think part of it is um, knowing knowing your your, your own field um, uh, if it's um, quite a niche area or um, I, I work in new religious movements so um, in, in locating uh, a list and a particular publisher, um, I kind of educated myself on, on where it would best fit and looked at what had already been published and um, also looked at a series. So um, in terms of marketing a, a monograph, um, it's, it's usually good to be in, in a series. Um, so to take those, those kinds of things into account as well. You often have to cite this in your proposal as well, like your, your own research into the field that you're publishing in, you have to know it a bit, yeah. I'm Anya Doctor. I did my PhD at Cambridge. I recently finished, and I've started postdocing there as well. Thank you. Um, I have a brief question about interdisciplinarity. Um, I know that religious studies is its own thing, but many people approach it as a subject from other fields. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions for scholars who are, out, are outside of the core area of research who would like to publish within religious studies. Um, well, I think uh, religion has a very long tradition of trying to absorb work from scholars outside of religious studies. Uh, and the, uh, so if you ask, does one get in not being part of the tribe? Uh, I'd say this is not really an issue, is it? No. Um, but uh, I, I think... Uh, um, actually, uh, when you look at open access, uh, there, uh, there are quite a number of interdisciplinary journals that are uh, leading. Uh, and, and, and my impression is that kind of the disciplinary uh, journals, they have a long history uh, and they are quite established. Uh, and uh, sometimes new ones come up when new pub and publishers want to start publishing journals, etc. But basically, there the dice are cast. Uh, and uh, as long as th these journals aren't run by some association that uses membership fees to sponsor journals that might feed into open access, um, I think the traditional journals are not really uh, at the forefront of this. So, if, but uh, in, in the interdisciplinary f fields, that is very different because they aren't kind of part of these disciplinary power structures. Um, and uh, so, uh, there are, I, I think on in the interdisciplinary field, the open access land landscape is much, much more vibrant. Uh, and this might actually be a very interesting option for, for, for scholars to, to, to get published. Uh, uh, also more and, and get a more widely, wider reading uh, because you are in the open access landscape. Uh, I think it's a really important point uh, that you raise 
but not quite in the way you raise it. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I don't think Newman would reject an article simply because you don't belong to the tribe. Because we don't really actually know what tribe you belong to in one sense. But I think what you really need to do when you submit an article to a journal is know what its editorial range is, what its agenda is, what its scope is. Uh, uh, because, um, you know, sometimes I get articles, it's like, well, this would be a great article for a journal specifically devoted to a particular topic, but we're trying to reach a more general readership of all uh, scholars of religions, right? Uh, and so if it's too narrowly focused, then it's not right for us, but that does not mean it's, that doesn't mean it's not right for someplace else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, there are other ways that you can be out of scope as well. Right, so you have a sense for what the editorial policy of the journal is, what the journal is trying to accomplish, uh, the kinds of articles that they've published in the past. That's no guarantee that they're not going to go out on, uh, you know, go out of that that range. In Newman, we've got a, a habit of publishing a lot of, you know, philologically very heavy material. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're not going to publish something that's not philologically heavy. Um, I would welcome things that aren't philologically heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, if you have something that isn't philologically heavy, think about, you know, our journal. Uh, but I think that's, that's what you need to do is figure out what's the, editor what's the journal trying to do editorially mm -hmm. uh, and submit to them. You can always contact the editor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the editor will let you know. My name is Jan Podlapushnikov, and I would like uh, to ask a question uh, on uh, how do you meet the challenges of 21st century? I mean, do people still read uh, paper journals? Mm. Uh, do general public, not, uh, not scientists, not uh, limited? Uh, I mean, I noticed that uh, my grandfather, for example, reads, uh, but uh, I don't know what my children will be reading. Mm. Because all uh, contemporary generation is only in the internet, not uh, in the books anymore. I know that with Valerie, how do we yeah. as Valerie uh, Hall scientists could. meet this challenge Equinox, and how do we reach yeah. this audience like mm. general public? Mm. Yeah, I'd say um, our journals are all online and definitely the print is, is going way down. So it, the preference is for online journals now really. And I mean, we have one journal which is only online. Um, and I can see that others might potentially go that way. Or the other thing we're thinking about doing is perhaps having just one print volume at the end of each year with all of the issues in it, um, mm -hmm. rather than sending out individual issues mm -hmm. throughout the year. So um, yeah, it's definitely moving towards online for sure, I think. Mm. Uh, also, I'd add that again, books are slightly different. Um, we would sort of find uh, at Routledge that um, the increase in the share of where our revenue comes from is, is getting more and more from electronic, but not as quickly as you might think. So um, it was a sort of very fast increase and then um, has actually sort of tended to plateau a bit. Um, so uh, I think the technological changes are coming, but um, I think they're actually, in, not in every area of academia, I don't think they're going as quickly as people suspect they might, because um, there's still, uh, some people still just prefer printed stuff for all sorts of you know, reasons. But um, I think all publishers are definitely having to react to people expecting to be able to discover things. And I think that's the big thing about um, making your uh, content electronic is that it's just much easier to find you know, in the great sea of information. Um, so so uh, you know, adding discoverability tools, um, and I think a lot of publishers uh, are looking at how they can organize their content, how they can deliver their content in a way that you can find it simply and easily by typing in a couple of key search words. So I think that's probably going to be one of the key challenges going forward is it might still be in print, but it'll have to probably be print and electronic at all mm. times at least so people can find stuff and they might buy the print anyway after that. I'd like to ask actually briefly, Joshua and Valerie, um, if you are now advising um, the future of publishing as publishers and um, maybe either warning or preparing authors or or changing things so what would you say is to you think is developing that you, we need to know about perhaps and or oh, I have to 
I mean, it, um, in terms of, I guess, in terms of the commercial aspect, I guess that's always a priority. Yeah. Well, okay. So, um, obviously, for many of us, uh, sort of governmental educational budgets and maybe sort of individual institutional library budgets have tended to shrink. Um, so, uh, you know, it was the case that libraries would sort of buy books just on the off chance they might need them, but now many of them have electronic systems where basically if enough people request it, then they automatically order a copy. So that um, is obviously better for libraries because they're only buying what people want and what people use, and that's absolutely fair enough. Uh, but publishers are going to have to react to that by actually it's not just enough to be in the general field and probably someone will pick it up. Um, actually, it's got to be useful to somebody. So I would think if you're thinking about putting your proposal together, like quite a lot of that proposal should be explained to me as an editor you know, who's going to read it, why is it useful, how does it fit into the general academic conversation that's going on in your mm. field, because um, uh, we're having to be more and more kind of judicious about what we put through because, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, people, it, things that are being bought are things that people are actively requesting to use increasingly anyway. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, one of the things we're trying to do is publish more textbooks. Um, and less monographs, probably, so fewer monographs. Um, but yeah, it's definitely true about the libraries, and it's a kind of customer demand-driven um, acquisitions model now. So um, definitely e-books are increasing, and print books are decreasing in terms of sales, I would say. Mm. And also library, library packages are something we're re really pushing at the moment. So we have subject packages with journals and books, just journals, just books. Libraries can choose which titles they want to have. Um, they can have front list, back list. There's, it's, it's basically bespoke um, packages for different libraries. So that's kind of where it's going for us really at the moment. Mm. Um, do people want to talk a little bit about what the process of reviewing is? Uh, you've indicated, Greg, about a little bit about the process, about where it goes to in the stages. Yeah. Um, and is there anything more to add to that about... Um, what do you have in mind specifically? Yeah, or um, with the journals in general, that do they all follow the same pattern, do you think? No, they all I have think... a checklist and they all have two reviewers. Well, I think, that, I think the protocol these days has become two blind reviewers. Yeah. Uh, if the reviewers disagree, uh, then a th I always try and get a third mm. person, uh, unless it's something that I know about. Uh, and then, um, you know, I also, I also try and assess, yeah. do I think the reviewer has been fair? Or do I think the reviewer has done a decent job? Some reviewers are very, very thorough. Some reviewers aren't very thorough. Sometimes you can see personal animosity in mm. the review, uh, and you try and allow for that. Um, as James said, you try and give the author some directions, right? Uh, I've had uh, cases where I've written to the uh, author, and I said, you know, this reviewer, just really a nasty person. Don't take it personally. I disagree with what, I mean, there's some things here that are worth considering, but don't take it personally, right? I have to say, I was thinking that the first time I had something published was based off of a conference paper because, and it was asked, it was invited to, you know, to submit, you know, the finished article, but it was still liable for, you know, revision or rejection. But it was, it, that was my foot in, and I think that's why presenting at conferences is also because there's lots of editors roaming around who might be looking for articles as well. But obviously, it, it depends, like, some of these journals that have this backlog, maybe that you're not do, hunting out, but there's probably lots of other journals who are actually looking for papers. Yeah, we, we often publish um, journals with thematic issues special issues which come from conferences. So that would just be papers from a particular conference and that's very successful. Sometimes they become book volumes as well afterwards. So. Mm. Did you want to comment on that? Actually, can I, no. that? I know well, Brill likes to have special issues because for, for Newman because they think that, you know, 
the, the different articles are going to feed off of each other. So uh, if you've got a whole set of articles, like we had a, 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 an issue on religion and terrorism that Jim Lewis edited, Mark Juergensmeyer was in there, Lauren Dawson was in there, and so on. Uh, and you know that then attracts attention because it, gets, it, it has higher visibility. So that's another thing to think about in terms of getting yourself published is not just to submit individual articles, but try and get a group of people together mm. to work on the same topic and then set a whole, set a, uh, you know, submit a whole block. Uh, and that's often received much more favorably. Yes, to propose a group of papers into like a theme or a particular problem that you are addressing together. Yeah. Um. If I just may comment on the backlog, there are different <laughs> procedures, of course, in the among the journals. So, for example, uh, with religion, we first publish digital, uh, and then eventually it comes in a, in a, in an issue. And but there can be a year or one and a half years between these two dates, whereas other journals, I think Newman still doesn't have that. So so then you are kind of more dependent on uh, on, on when the the next uh, slot is uh, uh, is free. But let me just add this. Uh, I'm, uh, I th I think uh, there we we do have very many journals out there, uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, publishers uh, apparently are eager to put out more journals because it uh, gives kind of payment upfront if you have subscribers. Uh, so it's uh, apparently a lucrative uh, strategy and, and kind of the field is in kind of an ecology, right? Uh, that, uh, or a market um, where all, all the time new players want to come in and it's then the question, are they sustainable? Is maybe, is the thematic range too small or, or I don't know, or key actors disappear or change, shift their interest? Uh, or, but in general, there are very many journals in the field. Um, and in, in that sense, really, it shouldn't be impossible to be published. Uh, it's rather the, the contrary. The contrary is the fact is that there are very few good or very good articles out there. Um, if you get them, uh, if you get them to us, we'd be delighted. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think we can just say that. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the, you get many articles, but w the 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 ones that really kind of make a point, argue solidly, give a clear a clean argument, have a good documentation, make some contribution, uh, are, 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 are well written and uh, uh, somehow relevant, uh, are not that many. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, and I, I just want to, I um, wrote that down, I wanted to get that across. So, on the one hand, there aren't that many good or very good or even shining articles out there. On the other hand, there are many journals. Uh, so, uh, don't be kind of discouraged if, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and try to, to, to seek journals maybe that fit your, your, your articles. Don't necessarily go to a generalist. Uh, uh, journal, if you have something that, for example, specifically deals with fieldwork, right? Then there is a, a, a particular journal on fieldwork in religion, uh, where, where which maybe isn't that that of interest for a generalist uh, journal. So, so try to screen the journal landscape, and you'll be surprised how many journals there are, um, and they're all craving for content, right? Um, uh, and that is basically uh, what, uh, yeah, uh, you, want, you want to add something? Yeah. Oh, there's two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I can't, oh, apparently I can't present <laughs> you <Yeah>. anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking, what, I would, what would I say coming to this? Uh, uh, and I, I agree with Mikhail. There are plenty of opportunities out there. Um, there. All you have to do to get published is have something important to say and say it well. Right? Have something important to say and say it well. Uh, and then find somebody who wants to hear it. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, uh, be really self critical. But then also write and write and write. Writing's not something that human beings, the human brain, did not evolve to write. We evolved to speak, right? Uh, writing is a skill, writing is an art, it's something that takes practice. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. 
Um, and uh, sometimes you may think you have, you know, a great article. Be critical. I mean, you can write an article and then look at it. I've done this. Say, this is garbage. Why did I write this, right? Um, just decide not to submit it anywhere because um, you just don't like it anymore. But then you turn to something else and move on from there, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have something to say, if you have something important to say, and you can say it well, somebody will publish mm -hmm. it. I would, we go to um, you in the middle, I think, as you haven't asked a question yet. Yeah. yeah hi, thank you. I'm Monica from SOAS, and um, I'm, I'm doing my PhD there now. And I would like to know how you uh, deal with the different scenarios of knowledge production between the Global North and the Global South. So the moment you uh, have your articles have to be paid for, a lot of people are being excluded, right, uh, from accessing this kind of the knowledge and being part of the system of knowledge production. So, and as somebody who is working in the Global South, I really would like to have my work being accessible to the people I'm working with. So now I'm, I'm facing this moral dilemma. Um, on the one side, that is there, but on the other side, I also would like to uh, pursue a career in academia. So do you see any solutions to this or any uh, suggestions on this, please? I think in Greg Ellis. Yeah, this is, um, I didn't know, yeah. Uh, I think that's a really, really important question um, and it doesn't just involve publication, but involves the entire ac the, in the activity of the entire academy. I think there's it's probably uh, an, uh, uh, well maybe a question that's under people's radars, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's still there. Um, it be it becomes a real problem because scholarly conventions differ from one place to the next to the next to the next, right? Um, and it's not always easy for reviewers, for editors to, I, I try and, and see, you know, try and discern where people are coming from and see potential uh, and see whether they can be, you know, made into something that's worthwhile and try and give advice in that way. Uh, I personally, as, um, you know, as during my time at Newman, I've really wanted to bring in uh, authors from different parts of the world we don't get much from the submitted from the global south. I wish we did. Um, you know, uh, we don't get much submitted from Asia. Uh, uh, I've, you know, there are certain problems there in terms of linguistic facility. Also, certain problems in terms of the audience that people want to address. Um, um, this is only tangentially related to what you asked, but one thing that's been really frustrating. Uh, for me, but I understand where it's coming from, because I mean, I've written in German. Uh, my German, I can talk in German, but my written German isn't great, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, if English, if you're writing in English, whether you are German or French or whatever language you're writing in, if it's not your native language, there are certain kinds of errors that people tend to make. And those, unless you learn the language at age five, age six, uh, I think it was this room. I heard a, a, a woman uh, who's now in Erlangen do a talk on language learning among by adults as versus language learning by kids. And there are certain kinds of mistakes that adults are just going to make routinely simply mm -hmm. because of the way they learn languages, right? Uh, and as an editor, I've spent, a, when I first started with Newman, we didn't have a copy editor, I spent a lot of time revising articles sentence by sentence by sentence by sentence, just reworking the English language. Mm. And that's frustrating. Um, and so it would be in your best interest, if English isn't your first language, German, French, whatever it is, to have someone read over the language and improve the language so that it looks as good as possible uh, when it's submitted, because it can be very interesting, but if it's going to cost me a hundred hours of time to put it in a readable fashion, I'm going to think three times before I accept it. Um, and um, you know, I've heard on the, I've spent way too much time revising people's English. I'm happy to do it, but uh, after a while, one just says, "Oh, enough is enough." Right. So, so keep that in mind. Right. Because um, a lot of people here yeah, make I'm it a, easy for huh? make it easier. Right. For them. Make it make yeah. it easy for us. If English is not your if you're submitting an article in English and I guess most people are, we're supposed to publish in German and French. We haven't done it for years. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're submitting an article in English, 
Have a native speaker if you can. Look it over so it reads well. Because um, um, otherwise, you know, it's just a real headache, and then you're going to think twice yeah. about it. Uh, so keep yeah. that in mind. Also keep in mind the, the scholarly conventions of where you're trying to publish. Right? I know, know you're also talking about um, access to the Global South as well, not just from the Global South to right. publishing, but right. access to the Global South. Right. Yeah, and, and how I personally can find a balance between, on the one side, trying to pursue a, a career in in English language journals. In the West yeah. where I'm living and at the same time having my um, writings accessible to the people whom I'm working with yeah. so that I also get a very uh, honest and critical feedback and so that the knowledge is not yeah. legitimized only from one side. I mean, I, as far as I know, if I'm something's in translation, you can publish it independently. I mean, through a different publisher. Um, what's yeah, the... That, that would depend on your contract. That depends on the... With yeah. the indexing like then it's not part of one of these oh, not like that, donors, no. right? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, do you have partners with uh, other, la obviously there's uh, foreign rights and I don't know if that's the kind of question we're looking at, but you want your uh, people that you work with to be able to read it. Yeah. 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 So uh, for example, in a university in, uh, I don't know, yeah. second grade uni yeah. university in, in, in South Asia or so. Like, I have studied there as well, and I have seen that so many of the journals are just not accessible because the universities do not have the um, mm. uh, subscriptions. So it just becomes very oh, difficult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there is a very one-sided knowledge which is legitimized from the West, even though we are talking about mm. other areas. So yeah. yeah, just briefly, just, yeah. Yeah, the only thing I can say is that for some journals, we do have preferential rates for some parts of the world. So it's worth looking on the journal website to see some, some of them are much cheaper, so. Yeah. I think we would, uh, oh, uh, sure, James, uh, yes. Uh, simply as, some, as I think maybe the only person on the panel who works on a non-English speaking uh, journal, a non-English language journal. For a start to make our work accessible to my colleagues in Russian universities, and we publish from our youth Russian university, our journal is open access and is devotedly open access, despite offers from Elsevier last year, we have decided to remain open access to provide access to our Russian colleagues. And I have to reflect um, and uh, repeat the sentiments uh, offered earlier is that basically, of course, I have many excellent Russian colleagues who wish mm. to publish in Western journals, who wish to publish in English. Mm. And often the boundary, the problem isn't language. They can write perfectly acceptable English with a few corrections here and there. It's the simply the academic Russian style and the English uh, or the Anglo academic style are almost are extremely different. And mm. when you translate and when you've put this into, uh, so when a Russian has written an English article, it does look, you know, um, very different to a, uh, and it it sometimes won't be accepted by uh, an English academic or an Anglo academic journal, precisely because the style is different. The Russians they like their sort of point by point argumentation mm. rather than a narrative, for instance. I, At least in, I'm a historian, mm. so we in in mm. British histor historical journals in particular we like a nice narrative, a nice story, you know. We don't like sort of this point-by-point -point analytical argumentation. I just wanted to actually say that we haven't actually uh, uh, talked about pay to publish, which you might feel under pressure to do as a new scholar. And don't do it. Um, and we'll try to find other ways first, yeah. Yeah, but I would like to end um, actually with our final advice and maybe one sentence. I know my, Michael has a list, but if you can have a final advice about what you wish the people who approach you had in mind or could do before they approach you. Before they approach me? Uh, no, I mean submit an uh, article. Well, uh, uh, yeah, let me, let me say something more general. Please. Yes, okay. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, Please don't let yourself be irritated or discouraged by the fact that everybody else seems to be publishing much more than you do, right? This is, I think, something that we all think, mm. that uh, all the others are much more productive. So, uh, I mean, put yourself kind of a realistic goal. What can I achieve in, uh, in given my constraints? Don't uh, 
don't think of, I don't know, seven pieces or articles when you have uh, lots of teaching to do. Um, make clear what you can achieve and don't try to get kind of distracted in all, in all sorts of directions. And I'd also say don't try to over-publish. Uh, there is the tendency to think that if you have a publication list of 20 titles, you'll get hired. If you only have three, you don't. Uh, I, I think uh, it, 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 it doesn't really work that well if you have 10 articles that basically all say the same thing and, and quote the same sources that will basically also at some point be held against you uh, by, by, some, by some committee. So rather try to do some really good pieces rather than do tons of things that are basically identical. Um, uh, and uh, another thing is, uh, uh, I think there are two pitfalls. One is you can be a perfectionist and the other one you can be sloppy. And you, you, you should avoid both. If you are a perfectionist, you will never end up publishing anything because you will always be unhappy. So uh, if you are also unhappy, spread the paper. Often people really like what you write, even though you don't. Uh, so it, uh, it, it helps you to kind of get a, it's always good to uh, get, get, another a, perspective. get other, other mm. perspectives, not only to get a criticism, but also to get encouragement. Mm -hmm. And don't try to be, but don't be sloppy either. I mean, really work on your writing, get your argument across and uh, don't try to take shortcuts. So I think it's 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 in between uh, it's mm. it's uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it's in between these two two other things. And one final thing, what we do very little still in religious studies or the study of religions or whatever you might call is is co-author. We get very few articles that are co-authors, don't you also, Greg? Uh, um, and. Uh, uh, I've co-authored with, uh, well, with a handful of people, and it's it's always been a very re rewarding process. And and some of the things that we've been talking about here actually become then part of the setup, right? That you comment on each other's uh, pieces, and uh, uh, I think this will be also. And when you get the the, the reports, you aren't kind of alone in in receiving the feedback. I think this is really a rewarding uh, experience, and uh, 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 I think f we are still doing this in a far too little degree. I think rather than everyone answers, there's someone who has something to add to that. That's different. Uh, uh, Greg, do you have something different to add to that, or? Or, uh, or Valerie and uh, Joshua, or James? I'm just going to add my perspective as a young Korea scholar. Um, in both of the jobs I have now, the attitude still is publish or perish. And you have to take that into account as you're publishing. As much as we would like to take all the time in the world to perfect and get our articles right, there is always going to be pressure on you from grant bodies, from university bodies, to publish as much as possible. Um, this can make it difficult sometimes to get the kind of quality that you would like. I know from my position I have to publish a certain amount in a year. Um, you are going to have to learn to deal with this, I think, um, most certainly to try and balance this, the, the, the two things between uh, quality and pressure. Um, but the thing I would emphasize, especially if you haven't published yet an academic article, you haven't published your, academic bo your book, is it is a learning experience. Your probably experience of writing so far is a long-form dissertation or a long-form thesis, not a 10,000-word article. It takes time to perfect that. So if your first article that okay, might get published doesn't satisfy your sort of desires for quality, well, over time, you'll get better at short-form writing, I think. Over time, you'll be able to perfect short-form writing. I've certainly found, comparing my sort of first 10,000-word uh, article to the one I last couple I've written, is I think, personally, I'm much more satisfied with how I write short-form now. Yeah. So that's my only advice. Yeah, uh, two pieces, actually. One, don't get discouraged. I don't know how you feel. Writing, for me, is a very personal thing. 
right? Uh, I, I sort of bleed myself onto the page in a way. And if you get somebody who's criticizing you, that can be taken very, very personally, right? And it can be a very discouraging experience. Don't let that happen, right? So you have to have a certain amount of self-confidence. Everybody gets criticism. Everybody gets rejected. Um, and you can't let that stop you, okay? So uh, I think that's a really, really important point about where the writer comes from. The second thing is, maybe I think we've gotten away from this a little bit, but I remember, you know, for a while, everything that was published was groundbreaking, was brilliant, was paradigm shifting, was, and I just hate that inflated rhetoric, right? I'd rather people be honest about what the contribution is that the article is making or that the manuscript is making and not say, this is changing the paradigm, it's, the way, it's gonna change the way people think for the next 200 years, because that just isn't gonna happen, right? Uh, in most cases, it's not gonna happen. Uh, so just be honest about, be honest to yourself and be honest to the people you're selling the material to about what the contribution is. Um, I'll add a very general uh, piece of advice. Um, the, the publisher perish uh, situation is true, um, but try not, to, try not to think of it that way or try not to focus on that. Um, try not to focus on you know, what will get you hired or what will be funded mm -hmm. because it's important to uh, to have a passion for what you do, um, because you need you need that um, if if you're going to be uh, an academic. It's um, you know you need you need to to love what you what you do, what you research, um, and to be enthusiastic about it. And when you publish, um, it opens up other opportunities, uh, and that you know academia is a community, and there were many positive positive outcomes, um, and all of the different aspects of academia are interconnected. Um, so, like, for example, people tried to uh, dissuade me from publishing on areas that really have nothing to do with my, my main area of research, things that I'm personally interested in. So I, I am interested in popular culture, <laughs> yeah. uh, like film studies, um, which is not the area that I work in. So I, I published something on that um, many years ago, and now I'm, I'm in a position to merge that into a study of religions, into to what I'm do, mainly doing now. So, um, you know, follow, follow yeah. what you most want to do. Yeah. And, I have uh, two make it audiences work. as well and two fields. So, you know, it's, it's okay to do that. Yeah. Um, last advice or? Yeah, I don't yeah. have a lot to add. I just, just um, the idea of collaboration is brilliant, I think, um, for mm. book projects and journal articles as well. And just, um, if you're not collaborating, just Get, try and get as much feedback from other people as you possibly can and, and make sure that mm. the kind of remit of the piece of writing is appropriate for the word length that you're given as well. I mean, I think that, that can be a problem sometimes. And lastly with Joshua. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I think I would say um, firstly that as a publisher, um, I want your book to be good uh, because I want to do good books. So um, don't feel like you have to come to me cap in hand. You know, it's actually, if you've got a good idea and a good book, I, I want to hear about it. I think secondly, just think about how you're explaining that idea. So if you can try and sort of come out of your kind of involvement with it for a second and think about it, you know, put yourself in my shoes. If, you know, if you just got this email through, um, you know, how might you react to it? And just a very small practical thing, if you were emailing someone like me kind of from, you know, out the blue, um, what I quite like is a bit of an email, introduce yourself, say, you know, what stage you're at, maybe a paragraph or something, um, just explaining the book. Uh, and then say, does that sound interesting? Because if you either just send me your thesis and go, do you want to publish it? I, you know, very honestly, I don't have time to sit and read your whole thesis. So, um, you know, I've got hundreds of emails a day, you know, hundreds of projects to look through a year. So, um, just a brief summary so that I can get the general gist of it. And that's going to make me much more likely to respond to you quickly. Um, if you leave it quite vague, I'm going to put that on the, yeah, I'll get to that in a bit pile. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's just a bit of honesty, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. brief, concise detail in your initial contact with me will probably go a long way. Yes. Well, I think we'll end it here and I'd like to thank our speakers here answering questions and also all of you for coming and staying this long and asking questions. 
And uh, so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference and come and speak to the publishers.